Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Sound Strategic Podcast for 2021. I'm Maya Nowens, and today we'll be discussing Taiwan, its geopolitical importance, and the challenges it might face in the year ahead. To help me address this topic, I'm joined by Dr. Brendan Taylor, Professor of Strategic Studies at the Strategic and Defense Studies Center at the Australian National University, and author of a recent IISS Adelphi book, Dangerous Decade, Taiwan Security and Crisis Management. Thank you for joining me today, Brendan. Thanks so much for having me, Maya. So before we get into Taiwan's growing strategic importance in the Indo-Pacific region, perhaps we could start by discussing how Taiwan handled the hugely disruptive events of 2020. The year started with the re-election of President Tsai Ing-wen, who won on a phenomenal scale and ran on a pro-democratic platform in January. Um, And Taiwan won international praise for its effective handling of the COVID-19 crisis, which other countries, particularly in the West, continue to struggle with today. However, events also affected Taiwan that happened outside of Taiwan, such as uh, the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong late in 2020, which essentially violated the one country, two systems policy previously maintained by China and also uh, previously directed as a possible solution for Taiwan. So let me ask you, what do you think, how do you think Taiwan has handled these events in 2020? Well, I think, Mayor, if you look at um, at Taiwan and, and compare it to anywhere else in, in the world, Taiwan has really emerged as a, as a bit of a poster child for, in terms of responses to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. It's um, uh, it's been able to um, to to really come through um, this crisis with um, with minimal damage. Um, one of the few economies in the world that's actually been able to grow um, in in 2020, um, albeit at a relatively low rate, only only about two uh, percent. In, in 2020, but I think most countries, um, most places around the world, I think would would uh, would take that um, that result. Um, I think Tsai Ing-wen, um, her fortunes, and, and as you mentioned, her landslide victory uh, in the January 2020 elections are also um, quite phenomenal. When you think about her flagging fortunes, um, even a couple of years before that, um, if we think back to 2018, um, um, her party, the, the DPP, um, performed really poorly in. Um, uh, in local elections in, in Taiwan um, uh, against uh, uh, the opposition party, the, the Kuomintang uh, or KMT. Um, and, but um, Tsai Ing-wen, partly, partly for reasons to do with what happened in Hong Kong, um, was able to, to recover quite strongly and even recover from uh, a challenge from within uh, her own party, uh, from her own, um, from her now uh, deputy um, leader, um, uh, of her of the the DPP, so um, it has been quite a phenomenal um, turnaround. Um, as you say, definitely linked to events in in Hong Kong. There's always a very close relationship between what happens in Hong Kong um, and what happens in, um, in in Taiwan. But certainly, 2020 would go down as a successful year in many regards um, for for Tsai Ing Wen. Maybe turning to uh, a less uh, successful or, or potentially a more dangerous aspect uh, of Taiwan's foreign relations and, and where it currently sits in international relations. Taiwan is increasingly seen as a potential flashpoint between the growing rivalry between the United States and China, a point that you raise in your book, A Dangerous Decade. So why is Taiwan so important to China and the United States? I think it's um that's a you know a very a very big uh, question and um and uh, hopefully your your listeners will be be willing to um to read the book or or now listen to the book as an audio book um uh, to be able to find out all of all of the answers um to that um but I mean Taiwan has has long long been a flashpoint um in the um what's now referred to as the the Indo Pacific region there's been uh, several crises um over this um, disputed island a couple of um, fairly significant crises back in the 1950s. Um, at the, the height of the Cold War, and another crisis um, in the mid-1990s. What I argue in the book is that um, there's currently another crisis brewing, um, a very serious crisis brewing um, over Taiwan. Um, and I argue, um, perhaps controversially, um, that this crisis is going to be um, more significant and more serious than, than any of those previous um, three crises. I think that the main reason for that is that the, the so-called status quo, which is largely... Um, uh, kept the peace um, over this disputed territory um, for, for much of the, the, the post-war period, is now beginning to, um, to fracture. Now, what, what do I mean by that, that status quo? Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, quite an informal set of, of relationships, but throughout much of that period, um, Taiwan was willing to accept something um, less than formal statehood. 
Um, China, because it didn't have the military cap capability to, to be able to take Taiwan by force, and in fact, wasn't even close to be, being able to have that capability, um, also uh, undertook really not to, uh, to invade the island. And the United States um, took quite an ambiguous position on the one hand, not really confirming that it would come to Taiwan's assistance in the event of a Chinese attack, but on the other hand, um, dissuading Taiwan from declaring independence from, from the mainland and really playing a kind of a balancing role between the two. What we've seen, I think, in, in recent years is, is really an unraveling of that, that status quo, which um, was successful for um, a number of decades. We've seen um, a really a, a very, and for very understandable reasons, um, a very a distinct um, emergence of, of a, a kind of a Taiwanese identity of those um, living on the island, who have never spent any time living on on the mainland and have a very um, you know close affinity um, now with with the island, and we see that in, in public opinion polls, um, where nearly seventy percent of the population now view themselves as being uh, exclusively Taiwanese. Um, as China's economic weight has grown, as its military weight has has grown, I don't think it's at the point yet where it could um, in, invade the, the island or take the island by force, but certainly that's becoming more of a a realistic prospect and it's one of the reasons why the book is called Dangerous Decade because I think as the, um, the next decade proceeds I think we are going to see um, that become a realistic option for China um, and as that happens I think um, that traditional role that the US has played as, as kind of a balancer between the two is, is, is also starting to, um, to evaporate. The, the grip of America um, on this particular flashpoint is, is starting to slip as, as America's ability to come to Taiwan's defence um, is, is gradually uh, slipping away. And as that happens, I think we've seen quite an unusual situation where the United States is, is clinging closer and closer to, um, to, to Taiwan. Um, really, the relations between the US and Taiwan, particularly their strategic relations, I think are now closer now than at, than at any time uh, since those two had, had a formal alliance relationship that started back in 1954 and that ended with US China normalization uh, in, uh, in the late 1970s. Can I maybe just dig in a little deeper uh, with regards to why Taiwan is strategically important for uh, China? Is it a question of um, access beyond the first island chain? Or is it a question of unfinished business for the CCP? How is this viewed in Beijing? Well, I think um, all, all of the above would, would be my, my immediate answer. But I think certainly um, that, uh, that point about this being un unfinished business, I think from China's perspective and especially um, from Xi Jinping's um, perspective, um, resolving the the, um, the issue of Taiwan is, is really core to, um, to to what he calls his, his China dream. That that idea of making China wealthy and powerful again, so it's never in a position to be able to be um, carved up as it was during the the 19th century, during that so-called century of humiliation, where the European powers essentially came in and um, and divided uh, uh, China up along with uh, along with Japan. So I think that that's certainly a, a big a big part of it. But um, but you're absolutely right. Strategically, um, because of its strategic uh, location, um, Taiwan is is also uh, seen as as important to uh, to mainland China. Um, back during that that Cold War period, um, uh, the American General Douglas MacArthur famously uh, described Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier because of its um, proximity to uh, to China and the the ability to project force um, against the mainland. I think what we're seeing. Today is is that uh, argument kind of being flipped on its on its head, where um, if China was able to uh, to gain access to um, to Taiwan or gain control of Taiwan, it would it would really improve and enhance China's ability to be able to project power uh, out into the Western Pacific as as part of its larger goal uh, of becoming the, the dominant power um, in in the Asian region. And in that respect, I suppose it's not just an important strategic point for China, but also for the United States for regional powers like Japan. Uh, and even to some extent, I suppose, um, Southeast Asian neighbours as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there is an argument that's made um, along those lines. To be honest, it's an argument that I'm a, a little sceptical about. I think that there are there are some commentators who, who argue that um, that if the US were to abandon Taiwan or if it, uh, if it wasn't able to, to come to Taiwan's defence, that, that that would have um, ripple effects throughout the whole US alliance network um, in Asia. I, I think if we look back over, over history, I think, and, and we delve into the historical sources there, are, there is evidence to suggest that that may not necessarily be the, be the case. Um, this is something that my colleague at the, the ANU, um, Ian Henry, has, has written about uh, very recently in a very good article for the journal International Security, where he suggests that um, the interdependencies between uh, alliances aren't perhaps as, as tight 
um, as, as some of those arguments um, suggest. But that certainly is a very uh, a prominent view, um, a very commonly held view that if, if the US was to abandon Taiwan, uh, that that would lead to the, the whole uh, US alliance uh, system um, unraveling. So that's, that's certainly an argument I think is very prevalent in Washington at present. So you mentioned that you don't think um, China is in a place militarily to uh, force reunification uh, of Taiwan with the mainland um, anytime soon, meaning in the next couple of years, I suppose. But China, of course, does use very strong rhetoric when it talks about reunification. We've heard President Xi Jinping in a number of occasions, um, not least in January 2020, talk about the option of force still being on the table should Taiwan not choose to reunify peacefully. So do you think that this, what impact does this rhetoric have on Taiwan? Do you think it um, has an actual impact? Or do you think that the Taiwanese think, well, this has always been the case? So what's the change? Well, I think certainly um, Xi's rhetoric is, is designed to try and, and deter um, Taiwan from from declaring independence in any in any formal sense. And I think it's not just been uh, rhetoric in this case. I think that there are also been uh, there's also been a, a stepping up of, of coercive um, actions um, against the island as well to try and back up the, um, those, those statements. So, for instance, in, in recent months, we've seen a, a real increase, very significant increase in. Um, in the number of um, uh, of Chinese military aircraft um, flying into um, the air defence identification zone, um, the airspace surrounding uh, Taiwan, um, some of the latest figures that the Taiwanese Ministry of uh, National Defence put, put out in October um, suggested that that the number of sorties that um, that the Taiwanese Air Force had had to fly um, in 2020 alone, um, up in, in the first 10 months of 2020. Uh, alone were over 4,000. I think it was 4,132 was a precise figure. We've seen this the same uh, in the waters surrounding um, Taiwan. We've seen um, o- over a thousand um, inst- instances where um, t- the Taiwanese Navy has had to respond to um, incursions um, by uh, Chinese military um, ships as well. So certainly we've seen a, a real increase in this um, coercive pressure and particularly military coercion, uh, as well as other forms of, of coercion, such as uh, diplomatic coercion and, and economic uh, coercion as well. So certainly, um, I think the primary purpose of that is to try and, uh, at this juncture, to deter any kind of um, formal declaration of, of independence um, on the part of the Taiwanese. And yet they're, you think, still not in a place militarily to force reunification. Why is that? I think not not uh, not quite at this juncture. I think they're still um, perhaps another seven or eight years away away from that. Um, uh, China began, as you would know, a, a quite a substantial program of, of military modernization uh, that began in the, the mid 1990s, and there are a couple of decades into that. Um, but I think that one of the you know some in some ways alarming things to think about is that that process of military modernization still has about another three decades um, to run. That's kind of what. Uh, Xi Jinping has talked about in terms of making China a world-class military power by uh, by 2049, the, the 100th anniversary of the, the People's Republic of um, uh, of China. So that's that certainly um, remains a, a work in, in progress. Um, but I think what happens in about seven seven to eight years from now, um, unless there's some un- unanticipated technological breakthrough, is I think that we reach a, a quite an interesting and important tipping point where the United States um, really does begin to um, to lose the ability to actually come to Taiwan's um, defence because of the, um, the some of the types of of, uh, of weaponry that, that the Chinese have been developing, particularly um, its anti-shipping missiles that are um, in, improving in, in range and in accuracy. So uh, weapons such as the DF-21 and the DF-26, the so-called carrier killer missiles that have that capacity to to be able to target aircraft carriers and to force the US to to operate much further um, away from the, the Chinese mainland. But they've also been developing the, the capabilities um, uh, such as the sonars and the radars and the satellites to, to be able to target those um, those um, missiles much more effectively as um, as well. So I think that we, we reach a point um, where even in some categories now that the, the Chinese are, are beginning to rival um, the, the United States. But, but still, I think if there was a conflict today over Taiwan, um, albeit at very significant cost and, and risk. I think the US would probably still prevail today. But I think if we look at the the, um, the, the military balance between um, the, the two, that um, that by about seven seven or eight years from now, this we start to really reach that tipping point where I think that becomes um, a, a very different equation for the United States and, and China. 
Yeah, I actually agree with you on that entirely. Um, but I was wondering, related to this, how much of this do you think, and, and by this I mean retaking Taiwan or, or, or succeeding in reunifying Taiwan in whichever way uh, necessary or possible, how much of this do you think is a personal ambition for President Xi Jinping? Is this just something that will happen when the PLA is ready, or is it something that needs to happen during his tenure, however long that might be, or during his lifetime? Well, it's a really good question, and I, I think the honest answer is nobody nobody really knows the answer to that uh, that question. I think that there are some analysts who would suggest that uh, C's main aim is to uh, to get the discussion going, to get the, the process started, and it, even if he doesn't see that within within his his lifetime um, or within his term in office, which could be quite a long term in office, that, that as long as the process towards um, what the Chinese call reunification is, is started, that that will be enough for him. There are others who suggest that he has a very uh, strict timeline in, in mind, that um, you know, some have even suggested that he, he wants to um, uh, reunify by as early as, as 2021, um, the, the 100th um, uh, anniversary of the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. So uh, let's hope, um, given that we're in 2021 now, that that's not the not the case. Um, others have suggested that 2049 is um, is, is the year that, that he has in mind, that 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. Um, I'm not so sure that there is really a, a date, that he does have a, a, a date or a plan um, sitting in his, you know, locked away in his, his top drawer. Um, I think that um, if we go back and, and look historically at this uh, this question, that Chinese leaders have tended to be willing to to be quite patient. Um, uh, leaders like Mao, for instance, suggested that this is a, an issue that could wait 100 years to be resolved. Deng Xiaoping even went uh, as far as to suggest that um, China could wait a 1,000 years um, for it to be resolved. I don't think that that's uh, the case anymore. But having said that, I think, and what I argue in the book is that um, I, I think that the greatest risk of, um, of military conflict comes not from a, a kind of a preordained plan to retake the the island by force, but through some act of inadvertence or, or miscalculation in, in this environment where the uh, traditional status quo is starting to, to unravel and you get a, an incident, um, for instance, a collision between, uh, you know, aircraft or um, a, a missile accidentally firing, as, as did indeed happen back in, um, in July 2016, you get that happening on a really important an anniversary, like, um, you know, the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. And that, that then leads to an, an escalation because it unleashes, you know, forces of nationalism in, um, in, in China. So that's, that's the, the thing that really keeps me up uh, awake at night, the kind of the scenario that keeps me awake at night. Absolutely, and here the the uptick, significant uptick in sorties, is is a major concern, I suppose. Moving on to the United States, we could talk about this forever, but moving on to the United States, a new U.S. president will soon be inaugurated. Do you expect a major change in U.S.-Taiwan relations under a President Biden's administration? That's a really great question, also, and and it's something that I, that I think I'll be um, I'll be watching very carefully, as I'm sure you will. Um, as, as well, given the focus of, of your own work. Um, I think if we look back um, over the last couple of decades, one of the things that strikes me is that there has actually been a lot of continuity in the US approach towards Taiwan. There has been a gradual upgrading of that um, the relationship um, between the, the US and, um, and, and Taiwan. Um, and that goes right back to the, the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, it then occurred in uh, the Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration. So there has been this this continual um, improvement in the the relationship and upgrading of the um, the relationship. Um, even during the Obama administration, and this is significant from uh, the perspective of, of what Biden might do, um, there was very strong support um, for Taiwan during the Obama administration. The Obama administration, if we look back, actually saw. Uh, sold um, more arms to Taiwan or approved the sale of arms to Taiwan than any of those other presidents put together. But I think what was different between uh, or what changed between Obama and Trump was uh, that a lot of the support became a lot more public. So, for instance, um, the US publicised the fact that it was transiting monthly through the Taiwan Strait. There weren't really all that many more transits than there were during the uh, Obama years, but the US was very public about that. It was more public about um, it, its arms sales um, and more willing to sell arms that are arguably a bit of an offensive character, which is something the Obama administration tended not to do. So that's one of the things that I think is going to be really critical to watch, um, to see whether that genie is now out of the bottle and whether Biden will be, be willing and able to be much more public in his support for Taiwan, or whether he'll try and, and put that genie back into the 
um, the, the bottle again and, and still support Taiwan strongly, uh, but do so in a in much more subtle and, and, and nuanced way than, uh, than the Trump administration has. Absolutely. And I guess this, I suppose the question is, if we do continue on this tack, how much is that going to antagonize Beijing if we continue to see more arms sales uh, or, or increasingly um, controversial uh, arms sales from Beijing's perspective, more worrisome uh, transfers uh, of, of platforms and systems to Taiwan? Um, how much do you think that that will antagonize Beijing uh, as opposed to help Taiwan? At some point, the Taiwanese, of course, I, I think, are also concerned with not rocking the boat too much, as President Tsai Ing-wen has been careful not to do over the past few years. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think you know a lot of credit um, should go to, to Tsai Ing-wen. I think that she she has um, uh, really managed that um, that very difficult balance very very deftly and very. Uh, very carefully. In fact, one of the worries I, I have is that who, who comes after Tsai? Um, unlike Xi Jinping, uh, she comes to the, the end of her second term uh, in 2024, and then it'll be interesting to see um, who you know who succeeds her and, and whether it's um, uh, someone as, as skilled as, as she has uh, has been. And that'll certainly be a very tough act uh, for, um, for anyone to uh, to be able to, to follow. Um, I think in terms of, of um, US arms sales and, and other things that that may um, provoke um, uh, Beijing. I think one of the, the big challenges here is, is knowing where, where China's red lines really, really lie on this. Um, I mean, I think in, in some respects, we do have uh, an idea of where China's red lines lie because in, back in 2005, China did pass an anti-secession law where it, it was fairly specific about where those uh, red lines um, might lie um, or where they do lie. I think one of the big challenges though is that, that often um, China has a, an incentive to um, to make it look as though those red lines um, lie much closer to um, you know much much further forward than they than they do um, in reality. But having said that, um, those red lines can also shift depending upon the domestic situation within uh, China itself. So a, a, a Chinese leader that feels very very secure um, in, in their own position. Uh, domestically, maybe maybe willing to be a bit more relaxed about those red lines. A, a Chinese leader that's feeling very insecure um, for, uh, domestically might be uh, a lot more sensitive to um, to those sorts of, of things like like arms sales. So a, a lot of it's dependent upon the domestic context within um, China itself, and that um, that makes it much uh, much more difficult to to really ascertain um, how provocative at any given time uh, certain acts are going to be to to Beijing. Yeah, and of course, um, going back to that point that we that we raised earlier on in our discussion about when uh, Th- China might just or Beijing might just take uh, the decision to force reunification, this has to be ultimately a a, a calculation in which Beijing is a hundred percent secure and 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 can and a hundred percent confident in its ability to not only take Taiwan but hold Taiwan. Uh, in the event of a U.S. Uh, intervention, um, and definitely not a fight that uh, Ta- that Beijing can lose. No, I think that's that's absolutely right, Mayor. And I think that this is one of the things that um, you know it would essentially be political suicide for, for Xi Jinping to uh, to try and take Taiwan um, by force and to fail in that uh, in that endeavour. So that's I think uh, potentially quite a, a stabilising um, uh, factor when we when we think about this. This flashpoint, I think, is one of the reasons why, at least for the foreseeable future, um, China would prefer to be able to uh, to see Taiwan gradually uh, reincorporated or reunified with the mainland without actually having to use military force. But having said that, I think if, if Xi's hand is, is really is really forced, um, and you know, for instance, through a formal declaration um, of independence by by Taiwan, I think that he, that he would still be willing to um, to use force in in circumstances. Uh, such as that, and and over the last few years, I think we have, despite the fact that that Tsai has been, um, you know, very uh, adept in 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 managing this um, this balance. I think that that we have seen Taiwan gradually creep closer to declaring formal independence without uh, independence without actually crossing over that that line, and we've also seen the United States treat Taiwan more and more like an uh, an independent uh, state back in its. 2019 uh, Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, for instance, the US uh, referred to Taiwan as a country. That that was an unprecedented thing for the United States to um, to do, even though Taiwan does you know share many of the um, the, the features of a of a regular regular state. So um, so that's certainly something to be borne in mind as well. 
You mentioned Taiwan formally declaring independence, and I wanted to turn last, uh, but definitely not the least important point to discuss, Taiwanese domestic politics, because as strong and as confident um, as uh, President Tsai Ing-wen has handled uh, cross-strait relations over the past five years, um, there is, of course, a deep green faction within the DPP that she needs to uh, contend with as well, uh, which call for greater um, public acknowledgements or, or moves towards uh, Taiwanese formal independence. How is that debate currently progressing in Taiwan? Well, it certainly it, it just adds to the complexity of the situation for, uh, for Tsai Ing-wen in, in terms of, of managing it. Um, and it's something that within her own party, she's, she's had to uh, to manage, in, including through that that challenge um, uh, to become the the presidential candidate in the run up to the the January 2020 um, elections, that that challenge came from um, William Lai, who has um, uh, previously described himself as a Taiwan uh, independence worker, um, part of that deep green uh, faction, someone who who went on to become, uh, as I mentioned earlier, size uh, deputy. Uh, but nonetheless, that's um you know a, a very important part of um, of the, the DPP base, and it's um, certainly one that, that Tsai Ing-wen can't uh, ignore. And, and that's one of the, the complicating factors in terms of cross-strait relations as, as well, because um, uh, Xi Jinping has, has made very clear that, um, that China's preference is to, to adopt um, a, a version of the one country, two systems formula um, for, for Taiwan. In fact, when we look back to the origins of that formula, um, when Deng Xiaoping developed it, he actually had Taiwan um, in mind rather than Hong Kong, and subsequently it was uh, applied to um, to Hong Kong, but I think um, the Taiwanese have never really liked that formula um, all that much, and they've looked at at Taiwan and uh, at Hong Kong in in recent years, um, and they've liked it even even less. And I think that that's something where um, where Tsai Ing Wen has, has come out very strongly and said that the that the option of one country two systems is just not 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 on the table. Just um, in terms of any leader of Taiwan from her perspective, um, wouldn't be able to sign on to that. And it was interesting that. In the run-up to the January 2020 election, her uh, opponent um, Han Kuo Yu from the uh, the Kuomintang Party um, also said uh, that, that that formula would be one that um, that his party, which has traditionally had much closer relations with the mainland, also would never sign on to, and it would be over his dead body basically that um, that they would sign on to that. So he didn't fare very well in the election um, in in the end, um, but nonetheless, um, that was something that was seen as uh, as being not even not even possible for. A Kuomintang candidate. But I think that brings up a really interesting point about the future of the KMT, the Kuomintang Party in Taiwan, and where it actually stands and what it what its actual ethos is. Where does it stand on cross strait relations? It has in the past been the favorable party uh, from Beijing's perspective because of its more um, friendly view of cross strait relations. But at the moment, it seems to be. Um, still searching for a new identity following two um, quite severe um, national election losses. Yes, well, there was a, a glimmer of hope um, following those local elections in, in 2018, but um, you're absolutely right, that's that's gone away um, fairly rapidly and that the KMT is going through uh, a lot of introspection at, at the moment, a lot of soul searching um, at, at present. Um, there was even a discussion recently that the, the KMT may even abandon its support for something called the 1992 consensus. This has been quite an important part of the, um, the whole um, uh, Taiwan story. Um, this is an, a, a kind of quite a murky agreement. There's un, quite uncertainty as to whether it really even existed or, or not that was made back in, in uh, 1992 through some uh, semi-official organisations uh, from, from Taiwan and, and China that basically there was supposedly an, an agreement that um, that both sides agreed that there was one China, but they just had different interpretations of um, of what that one China was. Um, in January, when she was was elected in January 2016, um, Tsai Ing-wen uh, refused um, a, a request from Beijing to to recognise that 1992 um, consensus, and very understandably because of the um, the kind of the the desire for for greater independence or within her own own party, particularly within that deep green fraction of, of her party. And that was one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, that uh, that, the, that Beijing essentially cut off any kind of uh, diplomatic relations with um, with Taiwan. So this is potentially a, another destabilizing factor in this in this flashpoint. Um, you're absolutely right. In the past, the KMT, even when they've been in opposition, have been a kind of a, a point of contact between uh, the, the mainland and, and Taiwan. But as the party goes through this process of 
introspection um, and as it I think comes to that realization that it's it's not going to be able to to continue to maintain that posture of of being close to, to China and and to be viable domestically um, those points of contact between uh, China and, and uh, Taiwan I, I think are going to become uh, less in, in the future. So let's assume that formal independence isn't going to be declared in, in anytime soon, at least not under uh, President Tsai Ing-wen's watch uh, for the next three years. Where does Taiwan stand internationally then? Following COVID, we've seen a lot of public outreach uh, and um, support for Taiwan's handling of the COVID pandemic in Taiwan um, for its uh, foreign uh, global health assistance programs, um, sending masks and, uh, and PPE around the world. There's also been a, an uptick in the uh, liberal democratic uh, West uh, for Taiwan's strong democracy. Um, so, so where does Taiwan stand? Will we see greater international participation or support for Taiwan uh, to participate uh, more prominently internationally without formal independence being declared or without formal recognition of Taiwan's independence being shown by um, countries such as the United States? Where are we headed with this? I think, I think we will, but I think it'll be, um, it'll be limited. It'll be a kind of a, a very careful and, and, uh, and constrained um, growing closer to, um, to Taiwan. Um, I don't think, for instance, we're going to see um, uh, countries come out and, um, and start selling arms to, to Taiwan as, as occurred um, you know, several decades ago where Taiwan had, a, had about um, you know, 20 or more uh, international suppliers in, in addition to the United States, um, other countries that were willing to sell arms to, to Taiwan. I don't think we'll see that. I think we'll, we'll see uh, circumstances where those countries or some countries are maybe willing to, to quietly um, offer support to Taiwan, for instance, quietly helping it with um, its indigenous submarine um, development that it's um, it's undertaking at the moment, but not doing that very publicly, trying to do that kind of under under the radar, if you'll, you'll pardon the pun. So um, I think that that's something which is, um, you know, we will see um, Taiwan become more important, uh, try to diversify its its um, its uh, relationships with others in the region. This is something that Tsai Ing-wen has already been trying to do under her so-called new southbound um, policy that that has seen our treat, outreach to uh, to countries in Southeast Asia and, and South Asia, and also Australia and, and New Zealand, um, trying to uh, diversify its its economic relationships with the mainland, uh, understanding at the same time, and, and Taiwan in this respect faces quite a, a similar dilemma to uh, Australia in that those uh, interconnections, those relationships, that that trade dependence with the mainland is, is still substantial. In Taiwan's case, um, it's uh, about I think about forty percent of its exports go to, um, to to the mainland. So it's still a very very uh, substantial share of and diversification in, in that respect is uh, is going to be difficult in a, in a long road. Let me ask one last question. In light of the trade war, what are Taiwan's advantages? Where could it take advantage of the trade war at the moment between the U.S. Uh, and uh, China? And I'm thinking in particular here of Taiwan's advanced chip manufacturing uh, capabilities? Yeah, well, Taiwan is certainly very um, important in, in, uh, in, in that respect, um, uh, given its expertise in, in, in the manufacture of, um, of, of semiconductors. Um, and I think that that's an area where, in, in some respects, there's, there's nervousness in, in Taiwan that it could get caught up in, in, in the trade war, um, that it could end up being buffeted around by a, a kind of a, a genuine decoupling between um, the United States um, and China, given that it kind of does um, sit really in the center of some of those um, supply chains that have been uh, operative between the US and, and China for several decades um, now, and that are starting to come apart um, in, in, some, in some areas of, of technology. Um, having said that, I think that, that, that it will also present some opportunities for um, Taiwan. And we've seen that as recently as, as 2020, where the US didn't go uh, quite as far as to sign a free trade agreement with Taiwan as, as some commentators were calling for, but there, there were some uh, economic agreements made um, on issues such as infrastructure development um, and 5G um, te technology and, and also um, supply chains as, as well. So I think that um, up to a point that there will be opportunities um, for Taiwan, but um, I, I don't necessarily think that, uh, that it'll be in Taiwan's interest to see a complete uh, decoupling or, or a, a full-blown trade war uh, between the US and China. I think that um, a kind of a mix of, of uh, competition and cooperation between uh, the US and China is something that Taiwan would ideally like to like to see. 
keeping the relationship as stable as possible. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Brendan. We could talk about this for hours, I'm sure. Um, and hopefully we will have you back on the podcast soon. Well, thank you so much for having me, Mayor. I'm a big fan of the podcast, as is my seven-year-old daughter. So we'll list, uh, look forward to listening to this in the car as we're driving around Canberra sometime uh, uh, over the next week or so. So thank you again for having me. Brilliant. And we hope you enjoyed the show as well. There will be links to Brendan's book, Dangerous Decade, Taiwan Security and Crisis Management, in the show notes. But for more analysis of the latest defense and geopolitical issues, be sure to visit the IISS website or follow us on social media. And don't forget to rate and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you and see you next time.